Um, well, I mean, the project, you know, the, the title is fairly descriptive, The Hidden Histories of War Crimes Trials. We, um, you know, both my co-editor and I, Gary Simpson, I think we're fairly kind of historically oriented international criminal law scholars. Gary has written a lot about kind of the early evolution of international criminal law. I've, you know, written a book about uh, the Nuremberg military tribunals, which were in some sense kind of hidden trials that had not gotten anywhere near as much attention as they deserved before I wrote my book. And so I think it just dawned on us one day, hey, there must be a lot of international criminal law scholars out there um, who write on some kind of obscure trial uh, that we would all find really interesting if we knew it existed. And, you know, let's try to bring together all of these people. Um, and that was really the genesis of the project. So we organized a conference um, and had, I think, I can't remember, 35, 36 different people come and give papers. And, and then we picked the best ones and we solicited a few more and realized that we actually had a fairly, you know, certainly not comprehensive, but, you know, a, a fairly deep roster of really good essays on trials that, you know, maybe people had heard of but didn't know very much about, or some trials that, you know, even those of us who are hardcore international criminal law people said, really? Wow, that, that happened? Um, you know, and so that was kind of the motivating idea. I think there were two really interesting aspects. I think we really didn't realize going into the project how much there was still to say about some trials that actually are quite well known. So if you look at the trial of Peter von Hagenbach, all international criminal law scholars, when we give our history of international criminal law, we all say, oh, the field started in 1474 with the trial of Peter von Hagenbach, executed for what would be kind of today war crimes and crimes against humanity. And that's kind of our stock answer. But we had no idea that there was actually so many more nuances to the trial that nobody had talked about. And so having a chapter, the one by Greg Gordon, on that trial, it made us see a, you know, a really well-known trial in a completely new light. And so that was very surprising. And then the other thing that was really surprising was just that there actually were trials out there that none of us had ever heard of that were really, really relevant to the evolution of the field. So the one on the, on the Siamese mixed court, um, where they really anticipated a lot of kind of substantive international criminal law, I had never even heard of it. Gary had never heard of it. Most people had never heard of it. Um, and so it, it surprised us that there could be such a relevant trial that literally had never crossed our radar screens before. I think one of the takeaways from the chapters in the book is that it is very difficult <laughs> to have a successful war crimes trial. Um, and that's true whether you're talking about an international tribunal like the ICC or, you know, in, even perhaps more acutely, uh, a domestic court. We have a lot of chapters on domestic trials that we would not consider to be shining examples of due process, uh, would not consider to be shining examples of the fight against impunity. And, you know, I think because we're so used to focusing just on the big international tribunals, we forget how much more there is to kind of the, the uh, attempt to deal with mass atrocity through criminal prosecutions. And, and I think it's a healthy corrective to the field to say, you know, sometimes we do a really bad job <laughs> of prosecuting these, these, these crimes. And, and I think that emerges really acutely from a number of our chapters. Again, I think that, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier. Um, the, the most striking lesson is just how much history there is still out there to plumb. Um, you would think that a field that is not particularly old, not particularly deep in its sources, that, you know, we would have talked about all of the trials that there were to talk about. We would have explored all of the nuances of the trials that were out there. And, and creating this book you, makes you realize how much more there is to do. Well, I, I really hope it will inspire 
you know, the current generation of international criminal lawyers and the next generation of international criminal lawyers to really take history more seriously and, and to not look at the field as starting in 1946 with the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg and ending with the ICC. I mean, that's our very teleological historical narrative that we all tell. And it's just more complicated than that. It goes back much further than 1946. Uh, it goes to domestic trials that some of which we've heard about and some have yet to be even discussed at all. And so I hope there will be scholars who are looking more into the nooks and crannies of the history of our field to try to uncover these hidden histories. Um, I, I think it's really innovative and I, and I think it's really great. Um, you know, the, the biggest problem as an academic who publishes with an academic press is the books are extremely expensive. They're, you know, obviously in the area of the internet you can order them, but they're not, you know, you don't walk into any bookstore and find them in the window. They're much more specialized and, and because they're specialized and because they're expensive, there are a lot of people both kind of inside the academy and outside the academy that simply just can't afford to buy the book. And, you know, as an academic, you know, we don't write to make money. We write to, you know, convey our ideas and to, and to engage in public debate. And so to have a publishing platform in which all of those people who can't afford to pay for the hardback or even a paperback can still read the book, you know, I, I think is really a, a great thing for an academic.